Thank you, Nikki, for that introduction. And thank you to the Don't Forget the Bubbles organisers for inviting me to speak with you. In the, uh, it's only apt with the theme of the Conference of Science and Story that I'd like to talk about the science of allergy with the story of Tintin. So all stories need a character, and I, I am fortunate to have Tintin, who you can see here, with his faithful and trusty companion, Snowy. In this story, Tintin also has a little brother. Captain Haddock, you may know him as a sea explorer, but in this story, he's a food explorer. We also have, of course, Tintin's mother, who is Thompson, and like the twin detectives, she will ask you a lot of questions. And of course, Professor Calculus, a remarkable resemblance to my nonna Philomena. <laughs> when it comes to all food, she applies both art and science. Okay. So, as Nikki said, the key topics I'm going to cover today are anaphylaxis, food allergy in the context of peanut allergy, and thunderstorm asthma. So first, anaphylaxis. This paper by Mullins, 2016, talked about the increase in anaphylaxis fatalities in Australia from 1997 to 2013. This is the most up-to-date data that we have on this. 6.2% was the rise per annum of the prevalence of anaphylaxis fatalities. So what this equates to is each year there is about one death due to anaphylaxis in Australia per one million people. So this year we would anticipate about 25 anaphylaxis deaths. Now, the commonest causes of death are medications and insect sting, and it's most commonly in males over 50 who have comorbidities. Australia has a higher rate of anaphylaxis fatality than the United Kingdom, United States or Canada. If we take a step back for a moment and look at the prevalence of food allergy, so, or allergy in general actually, in Australia we have more than 4 million Australians with a, an allergic or an atopic disease. Regarding food allergy, we have the highest prevalence in the world in preschoolers. It's around 10%. And year on year, there are increasing presentations to emergency departments and to hospitals, admissions, where in the preschoolers, it's around 10% per year. Let's zoom in on food. 9.7% per year was the rise of food-related anaphylaxis deaths. Now, on the face of it, that sounds a bit concerning. But if you drill down on the numbers, it's only two, two or three people per year in Australia. So you say, oh, well, that's not a lot if you think about road traffic accident deaths or other causes. So I think what is important for us is to not overreact to food allergy or to allergy and anaphylaxis, but not to underreact either. We think about the numbers, so in Mullen's paper, about 60% of the fatalities are under 20 year olds, so children and teenagers. So food allergy is the paediatric disease that you will see a lot of. What was also very important in not just this paper, but if you look at other papers around the world, most deaths in food allergy, the patient already had that food allergy known. What this means is it's very important that we, our diagnosis and our management when we meet them is optimal. Okay. So diagnosis is challenging. And to illustrate, I'd like to go through a story of Tintin. I'd like to give you three scenarios. For each scenario, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in the audience if you think that anaphylaxis is the diagnosis. So in this scenario, here's Tintin, he's in the backyard playing with, his, with Snowy and his little brother. Tintin takes a, 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 a bar with peanuts and he has a bite out of it. 
Now, in the first scenario, Tintin has no past history of food allergy. He does not have asthma. He does not have atopy. He's completely um, well. Within 10 minutes, he starts to get a tingling of his lips and then some lip swelling. He has two, a couple of vomits. He starts to get shortness of breath. He feels wheeze and cough. He feels dizzy and slumps to the ground. Thompson rushes out because Haddock's away at a salami conference. And Thompson calls an ambulance who arrive and they give intramuscular adrenaline. They give a first round, a second dose. He, he responds and they take him to emergency. Raise your hands in the audience if you think that is anaphylaxis. That's most, 90 plus percent. Okay, scenario two, same past history, completely well, eats it, this time within 10 minutes, lip swelling only, and he starts to cough and have wheeze, which lasts for five minutes and spontaneously resolves. So Thompson picks him up and puts him in the car and drives him to you. Do you diagnose anaphylaxis? He's completely fine when he arrives, asymptomatic. Raise your hand high so I can see. We can do the Kevin McCaffrey thing and close your eyes if you don't want anyone else to see your answer. <laughs> Look, it's, that's probably about 30%, okay? Third scenario, this time, different past history. He actually has asthma, his current, current asthma, but on the day it's fine, but he's got current asthma, otherwise everything is the same. But this time, the only symptom he gets is within 10 minutes, he gets cough and wheeze, which lasts for five minutes and spontaneously resolves. And by the time he gets to you, he's completely fine. Raise your hand if you think that's anaphylaxis. Some brave people. Four. Okay. So, the answer is all three scenarios are anaphylaxis. All three, by definition. So don't worry if you didn't get that because it's quite normal. Because this paper of study of three Victorian emergency departments found that the diagnosis of anaphylaxis was made correctly half of the time. The main reason why it wasn't diagnosed was because by the time the patient got to hospital, they had resolved their symptoms. So, are our diagnostic skills no better than the flip of a coin? Or because although that may be normal, I don't think that's an acceptable standard of care. So what do we do about it? Well, let's talk about the definition. So this is the ASCIA definition, and the top half of the slide comes from their guideline. ASCIA is the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy. Tintin scenarios cover the definition here. On the bottom half of the slide is a snapshot from the ASCIA anaphylaxis action plan. You only need one feature from that list of dot points to be defined as anaphylaxis. So the challenge for all of us is let's be, no, let's be better than the flip of a coin in making the diagnosis. This is the ASCIA Anaphylaxis Action Plan in its current form. So many of you will be familiar with this. What I want to really zoom in on and highlight are the things that perhaps we have uh, emphasised more in the last couple of years or the things that the evidence tells us if we address and manage at risk, we may reduce fatalities. So, if your patient, so Tintin collapses, Tintin has symptoms, has anaphylaxis in the backyard, the first thing we recommend you do is lie the patient down. Don't let the patient stand up, don't let them walk. In Mullen's paper, 15 of the 22 food allergy deaths were allowed an upright posture they were allowed to stand and walk. Essentially, they had a cardiac arrest and died. Five of them were being driven to hospital when it happened. So the take-home message here is, if your patient has anaphylaxis, lie them down. They're allowed to sit up if their breathing is difficult, which is quite common in paediatric anaphylaxis, and bring 
the emergency services and the medication to the patient as a general rule. Okay. Adrenaline. So the global studies on anaphylaxis fatality talk about delays of adrenaline being a feature in, in deaths. So giving the right dose in the right place is very important. This snapshot table comes from the ASCIA plan. I know it's a little bit busy, but it really does summarise nicely our options. You can see that you want to give intramuscular adrenaline, so outer thigh. So not IV, not subcutaneous, intramuscular, not nebulised, intramuscular. And the dose, if you know the weight, which is helpful, will be 10 microgram per kilo. So that will be one in a thousand adrenaline is fairly widely available, little vial, 0.01 mils per kilo. Draw it up, keep it in the leg. If you don't know their weight, you can hopefully know their age and you can estimate from this. There will be times though where you're not able to give IM one in 1,000. Either you can't remember how to do it or you don't have it. In that case, even if you do have it, but you're not sure what to do, you can use an adrenaline auto-injector if the patient has one with them, if it's somebody else's. EpiPen is the product we have available, and there's only two options here. It's either going to be green, which is the junior, so if the patient is estimated under 20 kilogram, you give that. If they're, for everybody else, they get the yellow 300 microgram <coughs> auto-injector. Simple. I hope. There you go. So you've done that. What about asthma? So in Mullen's paper, two-thirds of food allergy deaths had active asthma. The bottom part of this slide is another snapshot from the ASCIA plan. Adrenaline trumps salbutamol in an asthmatic with food allergy who complains of sudden onset of breathing difficulty. If you think about, well, recently at the Royal Children's Hospital, we've uh, developed a statewide anaphylaxis guideline and an asthma guideline, and both talk to the other around recognising and treating asthma, but in the, in the suspected anaphylaxis with adrenaline first. We know that mitigating the risk of, or mitigating the risk of dying in anaphylaxis in, involves good asthma recognition and management of our patients. What happens next? So your patient has had two IM adrenaline and he's still in features of anaphylaxis and he's not improving, you need to be thinking about an adrenaline infusion at that point. A peripheral infusion, I highly recommend wherever you are that you consult. There are guidelines you can look at, but talk to your paediatric intensive care service, your retrieval team, because that patient will need, you, they can not only advise you of, of how to commence that, but that patient will need to be retrieved to a PICU for further care. Because once you get onto an infusion, that can become protracted and they may need that for 24 or 48 hours. There are many ways to do it and I'll refer you back to either ASCIA or other guidelines for how to do that. Next, let's say that's not needed and they have, the, they have no adrenaline or one dose or two doses and they come in and then they, they are recovering. They require four hours of observation from the last time you gave the adrenaline or if you didn't give it at all from when the event started. There's three things you need to do, we should do, with your patient before they go home. Number one, give them an action plan. So you can see here that there is the green plan as well, on the right. So that's for patients who don't require EpiPen as part of their management. In other respects, the, the plan is very similar. The reason you give them a colour, red or green, is it's an important cognitive aid for childcare and schools who have many children with allergy, and anaphylaxis so that if the child in the playground has symptoms, they can very quickly look and say, oh, this, Tintin has a red plan and an EpiPen auto-injector and here it is, so I can't find it, I'll get somebody else's and take it out. Second, EpiPen training. So show people how to use it. There are studies that told us that this can be tricky. It is blue to the sky and orange to the thigh. Third, refer to an allergy specialist. As a specialist in outpatients, 
I can say, I look at plans, I look back on the history if there's diagnostic doubt, we look at dosing, and we talk about their environment, food avoidance, uh, do they have asthma, and various things. Also perform testing, which can help guide what to do next. Some people find apps helpful. This is Allergy Pell. It's been developed through um, Professor Katie Allen uh, and through CIFAR and MCRI. And, and um, you can record lots of things in here. I often find in our patients, people arrive and they don't have their plan and they actually sometimes don't even have their EpiPen and they don't have anything because, as you know, people turn up unprepared or they're in a rush. But sometimes they find it helpful to say, well, actually, I've got it all here. So I accept that I'm asking a lot of you with this patient. I can tell you in my department at the Royal Children's, we are currently undertaking a quality improvement process. We're looking at our gaps and I expect our diagnostic and management gaps will be the same as other centres and solutions of how we're going to address this. If you can do the same where you work, I think that would be great for your patients. Okay, so Thompson says, okay, I've got that. I don't get why Tintin has a peanut allergy because when I was growing up, nobody had peanut allergy. It's a relatively recent thing, appeared in 1995. So, so she, Tint, Thompson says, but we don't know why, got it. Actually, in fact, nobody knows. My answer would be no one really knows is a short answer. Can you cure it? So this slide talks to that, peanut immunotherapy. SU is sustained unresponsiveness. This is the state or the goal of, of immunotherapy. So a patient has a food allergy, you give them the immunotherapy. If they then have a gap of not eating that food or the treatment and then have it again and don't react, that's called sustained unresponsiveness. That's ideal. That's akin to a normal person. You could eat a food, stop for a couple of months and go and eat it again and you don't react. P-POET is probiotic and peanut oral immunotherapy. In the initial study, they randomised peanut allergy children to either P-POET or placebo. At the end of it, about 80% of the P-POET group could tolerate peanut. Four years later, they invited them back, same two groups. They asked them to stop again for eight weeks, having any peanut, then they challenged them to peanut. The P-POET group, 58%, were able to tolerate it without reaction versus 7% of placebo. So sustained unresponsiveness was higher in P-POET treatment than placebo. Their conclusion is that P-POET can confer some long-term benefit to patients and perhaps this is a step towards developing food allergy treatments in the, in the developed world. So this is very exciting, watch this space. Professor Tang says in the next five to 10 years, they may be able to uh, get this right and if so, you may have peanut allergy appear as a disease and then have a cure in the space of 35 years. If you think about that compared to a lot of disease timelines in medicine, I mean, that's, that's light speed. So Thompson says, okay, I get it, we can't cure it, but can we prevent it in the little brother? Has anyone heard of the five Ds? Dry skin, diet, dogs dribble, and vitamin D. Look at this picture. Diet, uh, dry skin, so moisturising skin can prevent eczema. Diet, introducing food at the right time in an infant's feeding regimen around six months of age can help prevent. Dogs, pet dogs can help prevent. Dribble, sh shared microbial exposure with your siblings, other kids, your dog. And finally, vitamin D, not being deficient in sunshine. So Tintin says, okay, I get it. Then Haddock and Calculus arrive and say, what about homemade unprocessed food? Will that help? Can't tell you there's any evidence for that, but I can tell you I personally am conducting as much unscientific research as I can into this. <laughs> okay. So then Thompson says, I get that about the food, but Tintin has hay fever. Is Tintin going to die from this? Many of you will remember the Melbourne epidemic thunderstorm asthma event. It was a November evening in 2016. There were high pollen counts, Thunderstorm arrived, the pollen grains got taken up and broken into fine starch granules which were inhaled into the lower airways of people and susceptible people got bronchospasm. 
There were more than 3,000 emergency presentations over the next 30 hours. Most patients had no history of asthma, but the most severe, so the 10 adults who sadly died, all had an asthma history. No children died. But what you would say to Thompson is, well, first, we need to know if Tintin has ryegrass allergy or asthma, and that's why I recommend a specialist assessment and skin or blood uh, IgE testing as, as indicated. You need to know what the pollen count is. So this app on the left, the Melbourne Pollen Forecast, it's counted from Melbourne University, it starts in October, and you can look at it very quickly to know what the pollen, pollen counts are on any given day, and there are other places around Australia that count this. And lastly, you need to know, is there a thunderstorm? This app can tell you that, but so can other, you have other means. So you would say to Thompson, Tintin is unlikely to die from this, but in a, th in a thunderstorm on a high pollen count day, close all the doors and windows and keep Tintin inside. So my take home message is, close all the doors and windows, lie down and behold the peanut. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Um, that was really good. I don't know if there are any questions on Twitter. If you have any questions, then direct them at jesse at injectorange. Not a lot of questions, but, uh, but a lot of echoing and, and catching a lot of your key points. So I think that means a really well-designed talk because you made some hit home things there. Um, I guess one thing I'm curious about is the, the junior um, first responder in these cases. So junior nurses, junior doctors that are often in the, that in a place where they're seeing um, kids have an anaphylaxis case, um, that how do, how would do you teach that kind of co the decision making around that so that they're going to feel safe to actually com potentially commit an error of commission rather than omission? It's a great question, and we have looked at this both in our emergency department and um, in my role also as a simulation. Um, uh, the lead in my department, we have designed anaphylaxis scenarios. So every Thursday we run a, what we call a KISS, a Keep It Simple simulation, and this, this lasts for five minutes. It's in a bay in the emergency department, and we hit a buzzer and staff arrive. And recently, so in the, uh, a couple of months ago, for one entire month, we ran anaphylaxis scenario. So in that, they gathered, and we gave them this scenario of a child who was having anaphylaxis, and the learning outcomes we were focusing on was, is it anaphylaxis? So they need to make the diagnosis. How much adrenaline should they have? How are you going to give it? Where is it in the department? Who's going to give it? And then the other teamwork aspects that Vic was talking about earlier around communication and correct equipment and so on. So really, this is a way of bringing together, we have nursing staff of all levels, You'll have a, a junior nurse in the bay and an AUM. You will have the resident. We have resident registrar, senior registrar, fellow consultant on our shift. Then you'll have the mannequin, and then we'll have the educators who are running it. And so in this way, I think that simulation is a good way of doing that. Another way of doing it is, of course, training. And actually, in my hospital, we are in the process of mandatory training in all staff in diagnosis and management of anaphylaxis. So this is coming from our resus committee, top down. So that's a. Uh, so there are a couple of ways. Thanks. Is that excellent. That? Played played to my biases around simulation. So thank <laughs> you for confirming that. Uh, question. Um, so we often see young people that have carried over allergies for years and years and just present once a year for their EpiPen rewrite and their ASCIA rewrite. How often should we be doing RAS testing, particularly on the non-nut-based food allergies? to see if they've outgrown it to, say, um, give them an oral food challenge? Great question. So it, it changes with age, and essentially the younger you are, the more frequent that is required, and as you get older, it's less frequent. So I would say, uh, and then if it's a staple food, it should be looked at more frequently and less frequently if it isn't. So uh, in a, a child who is under one, who comes in with a food allergy, well, they will need a review sometime within the next six to 12 months because the sensitivity of the test may be low and the other reason, and improves with age, and the other reason, it, well, when I say with age, beyond 12 months, and the other reason is that it may be milk, a dairy state, or egg, 
which are actually the commonest food allergies you'll see. So they may need to be seen, I would say, by a specialist who can look at these things yearly until they get to uh, school. Now, many of those allergies they will outgrow, so milk and egg they may outgrow by school, so that will be very helpful. As you get older, though, well, the, the Department of Allergy where I work would say that we'd like to see them before they start primary school, before they start secondary school. So those intervals are long. That's up to five years. In, in private, patients may tend to be seen more frequently because there may be more access, but I would say, look, at least every two to three years, uh, and if there is any reaction or any perceived change to risk, then it may be helpful to get the specialist. Regarding challenges, to answer that question, it really does uh, rely on that assessment by a specialist where you do, you do the IgE testing. And I have to say, we really use skin prick testing um, as a specialist, as the gold standard in Australia to determine whether you're ready for a challenge. And essentially, if the skin test is below eight millimetres, uh, providing the controls are um, interpretable, then you will think about it, but other factors come into play. So if the patient has had anaphylaxis, you're more cautious, and that should be done in a, a setting like a hospital where you can provide full resuscitation facilities for anaphylaxis. If it's if and not... do a rasp first before giving them a skin prick if they've previously had anaphylaxis? I personally do a skin prick test yep. because I've been trained in that, and it is more specific and sensitive, but... Uh, if you're un not trained in that, you can use RAS testing, but the interpretation there is um, uh, a little bit different. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to wrap it up. I know there's another question. Can we leave it to the end, maybe, if we get some time? Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thanks. <laughs>